Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what we're going to talk about this time is going back to our, our spectrum here, and uh, rather than focusing on balance and postural control, we're going to slide over here and, and, and look at, at walking and running mechanics. And we're going to do this a, a couple different ways. Uh, I'm going to start off with a, an EMG study looking at muscle activation during gait, and then uh, from there go into more of the um, plantar pressure stuff and then finish up with, uh, with motion analysis. So in this particular study right here, we're looking at six muscles uh, in the lower extremity. Um, we're measuring these all on the, the same limb um, that they report chronic ankle instability on. And they're gonna be doing treadmill walking uh, at about uh, three miles per hour, which is pretty slow. Um, as we look at this, I'm gonna start up and look at timing of activation uh, relative to initial contact. So if we see some values up here that show um, negative values, a negative value actually means that that muscle is turning on before the foot hits the ground, so prior to initial contact, whereas a, a positive value is gonna indicate that the um, muscle turns on after the foot hits the ground. And if we look here, comparing our healthy group to our chronic ankle instability group, um, the first thing that we're gonna notice in uh, the healthy group is that we have some muscles that turn on prior to initial contact, like the anterior tibialis, and then more proximal muscles, like the rectus and biceps femoris and the gluteus medius, but that in our folks with chronic ankle instability, or I'm sorry, in our healthy people, the peroneus longus and the lateral gastroc turn on after the foot hits the ground. But when we compare this over to our chronic ankle instability group, the biggest thing we see is that in the individuals with chronic ankle instability, their peroneus longus actually turns on before the foot hits the ground. Now we might think, well, that, that's a good thing, right? That they're, they're actually going to be contracting the peroneus longus prior to the foot hitting the ground, and that that will actually increase the amount of stiffness we have across the lateral ankle, and that that could, could be seen as a, a protective mechanism. And, and that probably is the, the coping mechanism that, that we see there. But there may also be some, some potential consequences to that, as we'll see in, in the next graph here. And in this case, what we're looking at is the percent of time that a muscle is activated across the stride cycle. So the maximum that a muscle could be on would be 100% if it was literally on uh, being contracted the entire time. And what we see in this case is that in our chronic ankle instability group, the peroneus longus is on about 36% of the entire gait cycle. And in healthy subjects, that's only about 23%. So not only do we see that the peroneus longus is turning on earlier in our subjects with chronic ankle instability, but overall it's contracted for a greater period of time. And we need to think about that with repetitive steps because what we're probably seeing is the potential in a subject or a patient with chronic ankle instability for the peroneus longus to become fatigued faster because of the coping mechanism that they're doing of turning it, that muscle on earlier it's contracted for a longer period of time. And if you add that up over hundreds or thousands of steps, that's actually going to potentially um, fatigue that muscle quicker and uh, that could be a, a potential uh, risk for re-injury right there. Next, we're gonna take a look at, at in-shoe uh, plantar pressure values in folks with uh, chronic ankle instability. And what we're gonna use here is we have these instrumented insoles that can go right into the shoe. And there's actually 99 force sensors in each one of these. And they can measure vertical forces. We can run the uh, um, insoles up. These wires connect up to this backpack and then the backpack sends messages to a computer. So that's their wireless uh, system, although there, there are some wires here. But what we're gonna be able to do is to actually look at the pressures exhibited between the foot and the shoe as opposed to walking over a pressure mat or a force plate, we're actually looking at the pressures between the shoe and the floor. So in this case, we're, we're actually doing in-shoe measurement. And in this case, we're gonna be looking at them jogging on a treadmill. 
And what we do to analyze this data is we divide the, the foot up into different regions. Um, and we're going to see that what happens in people with chronic ankle instability is they have a slowed loading response. So in other words, they have a slower time or a longer time to peak pressure in their both medial and lateral rear foot and their medial midfoot. So that as they're going through a gait cycle, they are not pronating as quickly, okay? Um, that has some manifestations later on where they also have slower peak, uh, slower time to peak pressures up in the um, midfoot, but I think that's really an extension of what's happening back here. But perhaps what, what's most troubling is that the subjects are going to have, with chronic ankle instability, increased lateral loads along the lateral column of the foot, okay? So if you add this up together in terms of having a slowed loading response and then increase loads across the lateral column of the foot, these individuals with chronic ankle instability are not pronating as much, okay? So they're staying on the lateral aspect of their foot, okay? And again, if you think about the, the notion that they're activating their proneus longus muscle before the foot hits the ground, and then they're staying supinated. So we showed this somewhat in the, in the balance where they're, they're probably doing that in single limb stance as well. And now during uh, gait, and we have this for, for both walking and running, I'm just showing the, the running data here, but they have this same pattern of, of staying on the outside of their foot, which uh, again, you know, going towards that supinated position of the subtalar joint because that's the most stable position of the joint. But the consequences of this are that uh, they're pushing themselves more towards inversion uh, as a consequence of, of that. Next up, we'll, we'll look at some uh, things related to ankle uh, kinematics during jogging. So we're gonna have three groups here. We're gonna have our group with chronic ankle instability um, that uh, you can see, this is pretty representative of, of all of our studies here, but they've got a history of about six sprains. They're gonna rate their self-reported function as, as about 65%, so fairly, fairly low. We have another group that we call copers. These are people that have sprained their ankle one time more than a year ago and never had any problems after that. So we see the, this group that suffers an ankle sprain and, and copes with it and does not develop the chronic ankle instability. And then the third group we're gonna have are controls who have no history of lateral sprain at all. And we're specifically gonna look at their, their rear foot inversion and eversion and then their ankle planner and dorsiflexion motion. We're gonna do this in, on an instrumented treadmill um, where they uh, have markers on and a 12 camera system. And uh, we're gonna take about uh, 18 strides uh, average together for each subject for analysis here. If we take a look at, at this graph, the, the x-axis along the bottom here is the percentage of, of an entire gait cycle. So initial contact is here. This is uh, jogging, so toe off's gonna to be at about 40% and then terminal swing is out here at 100. Um, eversion is up, inversion is down. Our blue line here represents the control subjects who've never sprained, and our red line represents uh, our chronic ankle instability group. And we'll see that during the loading response, um, in terms of their inversion, eversion profile, they look pretty much the same. But as we start to get into the propulsive part of stance phase here, we see a separation where the chronic ankle instability group is gonna be more inverted than the controls, and they're gonna stay inverted throughout the entire swing phase, okay? And they're, the mean difference between groups across the, this entire phase is about five degrees. So throughout the entire swing phase of gait, the subjects with chronic ankle instability on regular steps where they're, they're jogging are about five degrees more inverted. And then look at what they have to do out here at the end. In order to get ready for initial contact, they have to concentrically contract their everters, okay? Which we've shown with the, the EMG data as well. So um, th there's actually a kinematic reason for why that muscle has to turn on earlier as well. So our group with chronic ankle instability, even on steps where they don't hyperinvert their ankle, are more inverted during the, the swing phase of gait. Now, 
you, this picture here looks exactly like my previous slide, except now we've got a green line up here. This green line represents the copers, okay? The red is the same from the previous slide, our chronic ankle instability group. Our copers, so those subjects who've sprained their ankle once more than a year ago and never have any problems, look just like the controls. So they do not adapt this more inverted posture during swing phase that we had with our chronic ankle instability group. Okay, this uh, graph now, same thing, only now dorsiflexion is up and plantar flexion is down. And what we see is we, we come through the loading response here, and again, it looks pretty similar. We do end up with the, the chronic ankle instability group being a little bit less dorsiflexed, right at the max uh, dorsiflexion at mid stance there, about five degrees or so. But then look at what happens out here at the end of swing phase again, okay? The chronic ankle instability group is about five degrees more plantar flexed than the controls. So our chronic ankle instability group on the steps where they don't sprain their ankle, about five degrees more plantar flexed and five degrees more inverted, okay? And this is during the swing phase, okay? So again, we think about all of the rehabilitation that we do and most of the rehabilitation we do is with the foot on the ground. And we don't necessarily think about gait retraining in the swing phase. And I think that's something we really need to focus on more. Now, this is where science breaks down a, a little bit. I'd like to flip my slide here and show you that our COPER group looks just like the controls when it comes to their, their dorsiflexion and plantar flexion profile, but they don't. Our COPER group, in this case, the, the green line, looks just like our chronic ankle instability group when it comes to plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So this t tells me that it's the combination of both inversion and the plantar flexion, okay? Just having less dorsiflexion or, or being more plantar flexed does not predispose uh, the COPER group to recurrent sprains, but when you combine that with more inversion, it does. We go back to our, our balanced training group uh, that we showed our, our protocol before, and we did pre and post gait analysis there as well, and we wanted to see if we could change their inversion and eversion profile. So in this case, what we have is our, uh, our orange line is uh, pre-balanced training, and our blue line is post-balanced training in our group of people who had chronic ankle instability but, but, uh, and did the rehab. We made them more everted, okay? But we made them more everted up here, okay? So kind of at the, the end of stance and the beginning of swing, we were not able to change their amount of eversion back here where we really wanted to. So we do get some difference uh, right around uh, on both sides of toe off, about three degrees more everted. But this is where we really wanted to change them. And by doing just balance training, we weren't able to do that. And I think that points us to the direction of wanting to, um, to do more concentrated gait retraining exercises, specifically in the swing phase of gait and getting the, the subjects consciously um, focused on the position of their foot prior to it hitting the ground. Last up here, uh, we've got some, some new data where we're gonna look at ankle taping. We're gonna use uh, kind of the most common uh, ankle taping technique in North America, which is, is called the closed basket weave. So we start with, with some base strips, then gonna apply stirrups that are gonna pull from medial to lateral, uh, and we'll apply three of those. We then apply uh, heel locks uh, going underneath the foot and uh, pulling the, the heel towards eversion. So again, trying to pull them out of inversion and then finish up with a, a figure eight, which uh, again is gonna pull the foot uh, towards eversion. And we're gonna do the same thing, look at subjects uh, in terms of, these are folks with chronic ankle instability while well, they're taped and while well, they're not taped. So in red is gonna be the untaped and in purple is gonna be the taped. And what we see in terms of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion is that we actually end up um, limiting the amount of dorsiflexion that our subjects get when they're taped. So they don't reach as much dorsiflexion at, at mid stance, okay? But then when we look at their inversion and eversion profile, what we end up doing here is, again, up on the graph is, is eversion. So the subjects are more everted and that reaches statistical significance right here in the uh, 
early in the, the swing phase of gait, but they are somewhat more everted throughout the entire uh, gait cycle. So in conclusion, you know, if we take a look at the gait of, of people who have chronic ankle instability, it's characterized by, um, that says delayed, it's actually earlier and more inefficient proneus longus activation, increased lateral column loading uh, during stance, and a more inverted and plantar flexed position uh, during the swing phases of gait. Um, and conservative interventions can rectify some of these deficits, uh, balance-based rehab, uh, affecting uh, our inversion and eversion profiles during uh, the stance phase, and then the ankle taping uh, affecting during the swing. So thank you very much.